Chapter Three of A Cathedral Courtship by Kate Douglas Wiggin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Cathedral Courtship by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Three Bath. She. Bath, June 7, the best hotel. I met him at Wells and again this afternoon here. We are always being ridiculous, and he is always rescuing us. Aunt Cecilia never really sees him, and thus never recognizes him when he appears again, always as the flower of chivalry and guardian of ladies in distress. I will never again travel abroad without a man, even if I have to hire one from a feeble-minded asylum. We work like galley slaves, Aunt Cecilia and I, finding out about trains and things. Neither of us can understand Bradshaw, and I can't even grapple with the lesser intricacies of the ABC Railway Guide. The trains, so far as I can see, always arrive before they go out, and I can never tell whether to read up the page or down. It is certainly very queer that the stupidest man that breathes, one that barely escapes idiocy, can disentangle a railway guide when the brightest woman fails. Even the boots at the inn in Wells took my book, and, rubbing his frightfully dirty finger down the row of puzzling figures, found the place in a minute, and said, There you are, miss, it is very humiliating. I suppose there are Bradshaw professorships in the English universities, but the boots cannot have imbibed his knowledge there. A traveller at table d'hote dinner yesterday said there are three classes of Bradshaw trains in Great Britain. Those that depart and never arrive, those that arrive but never depart, and those that can be caught in transit, going on, like the wheel of eternity, with neither beginning nor end. All the time I have left from the study of routes and hotels I spend on guidebooks. Now, I'm sure that if any one of the men I know were here, he could tell me all that is necessary as we walk along the streets. I don't say it in a frivolous or sentimental spirit in the least, but I do affirm that there is hardly any juncture in life where one isn't better off for having a man about. I should never dare to divulge this to Aunt Cecilia, for she doesn't think men very nice. She excludes them from conversation as if they were indelicate subjects. But to go on, we were standing at the door of ye crown and keys at Wells, waiting for the fly which we had ordered to take us to the station, when who should drive up in a four-wheeler but the flower of chivalry? Aunt Cecilia was saying very audibly, We shall certainly miss the train, if the man doesn't come at once. Pray, take this cab, said the flower of chivalry. I'm not leaving for an hour or more. Aunt Cecilia got in without a murmur. I sneaked in after her, not daring to lift my eyes. I don't think she looked at him though she did vouchsafe the remark that he seemed to be a civil sort of person. I was walking about by myself this afternoon. Aunt Cecilia and I had taken a long drive, and she had dropped me in a quaint old part of the town that I might have a brisk walk home for exercise. Suddenly it began to rain, which it is apt to do in England, between the showers. At the same moment I espied a sign, Martha Huggins, licensed victualler. It was a nice, tidy little shop, with a fire on the hearth and flowers in the window, and I thought no one would catch me if I stepped inside to chat with Martha until the sun shone again. I fancied it would be delightful and dickensy to talk quietly with a licensed victualler by the name of Martha Huggins. Just after I settled myself, the flower of chivalry came in and ordered ale. I was disconcerted at being found in a dram shop alone, for I thought, after the bag episode, he might fancy us a family of inebriates. But he didn't evince the slightest astonishment. He merely lifted his hat, and walked out after he had finished his ale. He certainly has the loveliest manners, and his hair is a more beautiful color every time I see him. And so it goes on, and we never get any further. I like his politeness and his evident feeling that I can't be flirted and talked with like a forward boarding-school miss, but I must say I don't think much of his ingenuity. Of course one can't have all the virtues, but if I were he, I would part with my distinguished air, my charming ease. In fact, almost anything, 
if I could have in exchange a few grains of common sense, just enough to guide me in the practical affairs of life. I wonder what he is. He might be an artist, but he doesn't seem quite like an artist. Or just a dilettante, but he doesn't look in the least like a dilettante. Or he might be an architect, I think that is the most probable guess of all. Perhaps he is only going to be one of these things, for he can't be more than twenty-five or twenty-six. Still, he looks as if he were something already. That is, he has a kind of self-reliance in his mane. Not self-assertion, nor self-esteem, but belief in self, as if he were able, and knew that he was able, to conquer circumstances. Aunt Cecilia wouldn't stay at ye old bell and horns here. She looked under the bed, which, I insist, is an unfair test, and ordered her luggage to be taken instantly to the Grand Pump Room Hotel. Memoranda Bath became distinguished for its architecture and popular as a fashionable resort in the seventeenth century from the deserved repute of its waters and through the genius of two men, Wood the Architect and Beau Nash, Master of Ceremonies. A true picture of the society of the period is found in Smollett's Humphrey Clinker, which Aunt Cecilia says she will read and tell me what is necessary. Remember the window of the seven lights in the Abbey Church, the one with the angels ascending and descending? Also the rich perp chantry of Prior Bird, S. of Chancel. It is Murray who calls it a perp chantry, not I. She. June 8. It was very wet this morning, and I had breakfast in my room. The maid's name is Hetty Precious, and I could eat almost anything brought me by such a beautifully named person. A little parcel postmarked bath was on my tray, but as the address was printed, I have no clue to the sender. It was a wee copy of Jane Austen's Persuasion, which I have read before, but was glad to see again, because I had forgotten that the scene is partly laid in Bath, and now I can follow dear Anne and vain Sir Walter, hateful Elizabeth and scheming Mrs. Clay through Camden Place and Bath Street, Union Street, Milsom Street, and the Pump Yard. I can even follow them to the site of the White Hart Hotel, where the adorable Captain Wentworth wrote the letter to Anne after more than two hundred pages of suspense with what joy and relief did i read that letter i wonder if anne herself was any more excited than i at first i thought roderick abbott sent the book until i remembered that his literary taste is puck in america and pick me up and titbits in england and now i don't know what to think i turned to captain wentworth's letter in the last chapter but one. Oh, it is a beautiful letter I wish somebody would ever write me that he is half agony, half hope, and that I pierce his soul. Of course, it would be wicked to pierce a soul, and of course they wouldn't write that way nowadays, but there is something perfectly delightful about the expression. Well, when I found the place, what do you suppose? Some of the sentences in the letter seem to be underlined ever so faintly. So faintly, indeed that I cannot quite decide whether it's my imagination or a lead pencil, but this is the way it seems to look. I can listen no longer in silence. Underlined. I must speak to you by such means as are within my reach. And underlined. You pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Tell me not that I am too late, that such precious feelings are gone forever. I offer myself to you again with a heart even more your own than when you almost broke it, eight years and a half ago. Dare not say that man forgets sooner than woman, that his love has an earlier death. I have loved none but you. Unjust I may have been, weak and resentful I have been, but never inconstant. Underlined, you alone have brought me to Bath. For you alone, I think and plan. Have you not seen this? Can you fail to have understood my wishes? I had not waited even these ten days, could I have read your feelings, as I think you must have penetrated mine. And underlined. I can hardly write. I am every instant hearing something which overpowers me. You sink your voice, but I can distinguish the tones of that voice when they would be lost on others. Too good, too excellent creature. You do us justice indeed. You do believe that there is true attachment and constancy among men. Believe it to be most fervent, 
most undeviating, in F. W. Of course, this means nothing. Somebody has been reading the book, and marked it idly as he, or she, read. I can imagine someone's underlining a splendid sentiment like, dare not say that man forgets sooner than woman, but why should a reader lay stress on such a simple sentence as, you alone brought me to bath? End of chapter 3